David, whenever you're ready. Okay. All right, everybody. How's it going? Um, so I'll be giving my talk today. It's a little bit different than I've the, the talk you know I would normally give, which is a, kind of a dry uh, <coughs> academic uh, discussion about research. But what uh, we're trying to do here, I think, is give you a sense of who we are as human beings, because we never really met, unfortunately, because of Corona, because of COVID. And uh, I thought it might be fun, fun for me and hopefully interesting to you to see a little bit uh, about my career path because it was not linear at all. And I get a lot of questions from students about, you know, career choices and what should they do. And I, I get this, I get, the, I get a sense of anxiety, a lot of anxiety uh, from students a lot of the times. And I, I would like to share my anxiety and my sort of anxious <laughs> life, you know, but not, it wasn't really anxious, but, but sort of, sort of the, the steps that I had to take uh, in my career and um, just make, try to, try to share some points and some insights that I've, I think I can, I can give about uh, your professional career. So um, let, I guess just let's get going. Um, so in the beginning, I never wanted to be an engineer. My father was an engineer and uh, that was the last thing I wanted to be. And I grew up uh, in Israel on, on the coast of the Mediterranean. Uh, and I really didn't think about when I was in high school and as a, as, you know, a teenager, I didn't think about college. I didn't think about what I wanted to do when I was growing up. What I really wanted to do is to be a professional surfer and a professional traveler and ideally somebody just sits on the beach all the time. And I was, that, was, that was what I was primarily interested in. Um, my reading material and studying materials were uh, Surfer Magazine. And I used to uh, watch quality movies like Wave Warriors 4 uh, as an example. And I, I bring up Wave Warriors 4 because um, this is on VHS. So I'm old. And these are like VHS, VHS tapes that we used to get. <clears throat> and... Um, this Wave Warriors 4 actually was an inspiration for a big step in my life later on, but it was, um, I wanted to be this guy, standing on some, you know, deserted beach in Indonesia, um, going to go surf and, you know, just living the dream. Um, and my high school transcripts really reflected that fact because I was a solid C student. I was not very good. Uh, Contrary, so later on in life, I, was t I w used to tell the story that I was, uh, you know, I didn't try very hard in high school, but I always got good grades. It was a complete fabrication. And I, I only realized that when I went home several years ago, my mom came to me with a box of my crap and said, hey, take, take this, you know, either throw it away or take it. And I found all my uh, high school report cards. And indeed, I was a solid C student. Um, so uh, that, that was my high school time. But, you know, I'm from Israel originally. And when I was 18, I was told to go into the military. And because I love the ocean, I went into the Navy and I found a picture of my old ship. So the Israeli Navy is about 5,000 people. So it fits, the entire Navy fits on one US aircraft carrier, which the US has multiple. But so it's a very small sort of thing. And that, that was actually my ship. And I used to sit in the middle of the ship. I was a sonar operator. Uh, we were looking for submarines that never showed up. And I was very lucky because when I was, uh, in the Navy, uh, there were no wars at the, that period of time. So this is, I, I joined in 1994. Uh, and um, so it was a very relatively peaceful time. So I, I was lucky I didn't see any, any kind of uh, serious action. But um, in general, being ordered to do anything isn't great, right? We no, nobody likes to be told what to do. But the, having forced to go into the Navy did do a few things. First off, I got a break from school. Right, so up until that, that point, I was 12 years in school, just like everybody else. I had to stop. I had to go do something completely different. So I grew up a bit, which was very important. Um, I was handed eventually a lot of responsibility. So at my, you know, before I finished uh, my service, when I was almost 21 years old, I was in charge of over 40 soldiers that were under my direct command, and I, I had a lot of responsibility for their welfare. Um, so that's a, it's a lot of responsibility for somebody who's pretty young. So that was that's very different. Um, that's on one hand. On the other hand, um, when you're in the military, everything's taken care of for you, right? You don't have to do your laundry. You don't have to cook your own food. You don't have to pay your own bills. So on the one hand, it's a very coddling experience. On the other hand, you were handed a lot of real, real, real world responsibility. So that was a very, 
it was a very important period in, in everybody's life. You know, when you're young like that, you're sort of thrown out of your comfort zone. Um, so it was, it was interesting for me. But I didn't like it. And I was very happy to be done when I was 21. And um, you'll see in my presentation, I have my age listed here because I really want to emphasize how, how different my career path has been for most uh, Americans because um, just because of different decisions. And, and, and I guess the overriding point here of, of specifying my age is that you, you can relax a little bit. You're really young and you have a lot of time. Time is on your side. So you don't have to freak out if you're 22 or 23 and you still don't know what you want to do with your life. That's perfectly fine. You have you have decades to decide. Um, so I was 21, I got out of the military. I really wanted to go travel the world. I really wanted to go surf around the world. Uh, so first I waited tables for 12 months and I worked in some Asian fusion place and bus tables and waited tables and uh, collected money, lived at home with my parents. Uh, but I did that for 12 months. And then uh, once that was done, I traveled all over the world for about 18 months. And I started off over here in Israel and I flew to, uh, to Thailand first, and then I traveled all through Myanmar and Indonesia and Thailand and um, uh, Sri Lanka, Australia. I spent a lot of time there. I went to Hawaii, I went to Mexico, I went around the world. And I, um, I saw a very different uh, world than from where I came from, spent time in India as well. Uh, it was... Um, it matured me a lot. I realized that you know things that I thought were important were not important for other people. Uh, my beliefs were all relative. Uh, the what I thought was hard was absolutely nothing compared to the experiences of some people. Uh, it, it's a very big world out there, and there's a lot of people in it, and they have very different opinions than you, and they're all valid. So that grew me up a bit more. Got to surf some really heavy waves, so that was that was really fun. I met my uh, wife which was great. Uh, we, we ran into each other in Sri Lanka. She was on vacation and I was on vacation and we hit it off and we've been together for a long time now, for 23 years. Um, so that was awesome. And um, I ended up, my trip, I ended up in San Francisco and I got my first uh, real job. And again, this is going back, this is probably 1999 at this point. And um, it was just the beginning of the internet. So the internet has been, had been around obviously for a while since then, but not very many people were using it. And I had one of the first Hotmail accounts, if, that, if you can. So I knew how to use email. And because of that, I got a job for Williams Sonoma. And I was in their corporate headquarters in San Francisco in Giardelli Square. And I was uh, responsible for all the maintenance in this corporate headquarters in San Francisco. So it's basically a skyscraper. And when anybody's light went out or internet didn't work or something happened or air conditioner wasn't working, they would call me and I would go with um, a guy who, who actually knew how to fix things and we would go fix things. So he taught me how to be handy and how to fix things. And the only reason I got the job and you know I was sort of responsible for him was because I could use email. He, couldn't. he was 50 years old and had built basically half the buildings in San Francisco. So I was very fortunate um, in that in that regard, and it was a real it was a real thing, you know. So I got lucky there, and then um, after working there for a few months, uh, they came to me and they said, "Well, we're start this is how stupid I am." And they said, "We're starting uh, this new thing. We're going to call it the Internet Department, and we want you to be our first employee." So this is 1999. This is before the tech bubble, um, before the big stock market crash in 2000. And they said, they were like, they were, we we're going to give you some stock options in williamsonoma.com. And, you know, we, you're going to be our first employee for William Sonoma, which is a huge company. And me, like an idiot, was thinking to myself, who would buy anything online without, without checking it, without feeling in your hand? This thing has no future. So I was, you know, 22 years old at the time. So I said, no, I'm going to go to school. Um, so I, you know, ended up going back to, um, going back to Israel and going to school. And at that point, I was about 23. So then I started, um, started university back in Israel, a Hebrew university. It's where I did my undergraduate. And I decided to study uh, bio biology and math. Uh, why did I want to study biology and math? Why not? I like biology and I like math and it seemed like a reasonable thing to do. I was not really planning on 
being a biologist or a mathematician, but uh, I like my I like my classes. They, the math was incredibly challenging, but you know, learned how to do some pretty complicated math. Uh, overall, it was a great experience. Still had no idea what I wanted to do when I graduated. I was now 26 when I finished. The program there was three years to do your undergraduate. Um, but in my last year, I did work in a bioremediation lab as a, just as a student worker, like a lot of you have done. Uh, and that was a great experience. And um, I thought the concept of using uh, bacteria to clean things up, to clean up the environment was really cool. And um, again, not, not really knowing anything, not knowing anything about it when I got into it. Um, it didn't hurt that this is where I used to work. Uh, so the lab was actually on the Red Sea and I'd go down there every weekend and they had these oil slicks on, uh, we, use, we were using a cyanobacteria to degrade oil. Uh, and I got to stay in these little bungalows here right on the, on the sand and I would go diving every, every weekend. Uh, so that, that didn't hurt to, you know, to pique my interest <laughs> in this kind of research. But I did actually enjoy, uh, I did actually enjoy doing the work and I thought the concept of bioremediation was really, uh, was really interesting. So uh, I graduated and um, I was pretty, pretty sick of school at that point and I uh, got married and we decided to move to Vietnam. And I didn't do anything there. I was, I was, my title was an accompanying spouse. Uh, my wife had a big job and she was working and I was, we were living way up here in Vietnam. So that's right on the Chinese border. Uh, it's an area that, that looks like this. It's incredibly beautiful, incredibly remote and was there for about 12 months. And we were the only Americans in, I don't even know how many square, you know, radius of how many hundreds kilometers. Uh, it was a 12 hour motorcycle ride to Hanoi over mud roads. Uh, it was a real adventure, but it was, um, it was really fun. And during that time, I was trying to figure out what it was gonna do. And I uh, realized that um, if you wanted to do uh, things with bioremediation, or if you wanted to use bacteria to do any kind of treatment, you should study environmental engineering. So I decided to uh, apply for master's programs in environmental engineering, uh, took correspondence courses. This was before uh, courses were available online. So I had to like, I had to write in uh, letters to my, it was to the University of Arizona. So I used to mail in exams and they would mail me back my scores. And I got a few courses, engineering courses under my belt like that. And I, I was, ended up being accepted to UC Davis to the master's program there. And I was now 27 years old when I started uh, my master's. And again, not really having any clear idea of what I wanted to do or what interests me really, other than I thought bacteria were interesting and it would be interesting to uh, use bacteria to do work. Um, but once I got to UC Davis, uh, th that was the first sort of you know, lesson that I learned. Uh, you can't always do what you want. And a lot of your, particularly in research, your uh, research direction and your research activities are actually dictated by uh, whatever your PI needs, whatever your advisor needs. And that's something that you, you know, everybody on this call, uh, the professors absolutely understand. Uh, the graduate students should understand that the, uh, the ability to do research is uh, hinges upon the availability of funding and the availability of, availability of funding hinges on the desires of funding agencies. And when we, um, if we want to do research, we have to um, meet the needs of whatever funding agencies you're applying to at least halfway, which means that the graduate students can't just do whatever they want. They have to work on problems that have been identified by others. And that's fine. And I'll tell you why uh, in the next few slides. Um, so when I was at UC Davis, what I was working on, we would go out, out on these boats in Lake Tahoe, which, which was pretty nice, that was, so that was nice. But we would drop these discs, it's, a, it's called a Secchi, Secchi depth, uh, or a Secchi disc, and you drop it down the water column and you would measure at what depth the disc disappears. And it's a, basically a measure of water clarity. And I was doing uh, mathematical modeling of uh, lake water clarity. And I developed an aggregate, particle aggregation model for uh, Lake Tahoe. And I didn't understand what the point was at, of all that. It seemed to me like a gigantic waste of time at the time. But after a while of doing it, I realized a few things. First off, I realized that what I thought was important didn't really matter. 
and that really my perspective was very narrow at the time. I was 27 years old. I had never worked. I never had a real job in the field. I was not an environmental engineer yet. I didn't know what was going on. I thought things were important. They really weren't. The other things that I, some other insights that I had was that um, I didn't really know about much about the world. And I didn't really understand the needs of a lot of places, certainly not the needs of many communities in the United States and or the world. Um, but I did realize that being an engineer was a good fit for me. It was a good choice because I like to pro I like to solve problems. And ultimately, the that's really the job of an engineer is to take scientific principles and apply them apply them towards specific problems. And if you like to do that, then this is a great career choice for you. Um, and really the take home message from school, the, for me at that point, from a master's degree, but it's school's about learning new tools that ideally you can, you can apply anywhere. And it doesn't really matter where you apply them or how you apply them, but it's just gaining those tools. So you have to understand that while you're in school, you're not necessarily gonna be solving important problems, but you're gonna be developing tools in your tool belt or your tool chest that you can then use in the future. But for me, I was 29 years old and I was done with school. It was, I was at UC Davis for about a year, got my master's and I was finished um, and I was ready for something else. So I got my EIT and I moved to North Carolina. I got a job in an engineering firm and basically became a grown up, meaning I bought my first house. I had my first child um, and there's nothing like having a child to really sharpen your sense of responsibility. Um, and so far it's pretty standard stuff. But unfortunately, my job was not very much fun. What I thought I'd be something like this, you know, standing around with plans and looking at plants or something like that and being very sophisticated. What I actually did was this, was stand around tractors uh, wearing an orange vest and a hard hat and telling them where to dig. And um, so in many ways, that, I did not enjoy that. But the, what I did learn was how to write. And... I had a boss in my company, the person I, I reported to directly. He was a real stickler and he wasn't, he wasn't the nicest human being in the world, but um, he expected excellence in writing. So we would have to write these very lengthy reports about our, um, about our projects and what the projects were, it doesn't even matter. It was basically soil, soil remediation, which ended up being dig out the soil and send it to a hazardous waste site. But we had to write these reports. And I would submit my report and he would send it back to me and you know, just say, you know, this is complete garbage, rewrite. And I would send it back to him and say, no, this is garbage, rewrite, 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 rewrite. 20 times, 25 times. Eventually you understand that these, you know, you understand how to write reports. And that really taught me that period of time of actually working for a boss that can fire you while you have responsibilities like a mortgage and a family. Um, it teaches you to do things right. And there was no flexibility. Uh, there was no understanding. There was just doing the job and, and excellence was expected. And um, some of you, most of you students probably haven't experienced yet, that yet, uh, meaning your work has real consequences and you really have to excel uh, or else you pay a price, a personal price. Um, but that really taught me how to write. And that, that has served me throughout my career very well, that experience, even though it was not very pleasant. Um, so I, I decided to go back to school. So I really wanted to do research on wastewater treatment. I was still interested in, in biological uh, treatment of environmental problems and where, you know, what's the best uh, place to do that, if not uh, wastewater treatment, where you, uh, you have activated sludge, right? So I thought that was really important to be able to do research on uh, basically on activated sludge. Um, so I applied and I was living in North Carolina in Chapel Hill at the time. So I applied to the two local universities, which was UNC Chapel Hill and Duke. And I was um, very unceremoniously informed by uh, the chair of the department at UNC, a very distinguished fellow named uh, Mike Aiken, I, I think he's still around, um, that there was absolutely no money in wastewater research and he could offer me a position uh, doing soil research at UNC. Um, but, you know, somebody from Duke contacted me and said, uh, oh, I have some funding to do uh, work on wastewater. Uh, so that's where 
I ended up going and I was now 31 years old when I started my PhD uh, at Duke. So I started doing work on wastewater. I was really happy about it. Uh, and in my imagination, like this was my path. I mean, doing wastewater research and be looking at bacteria, how do you improve settling and sludge and things like that. Um, and uh, my first PhD advisor, who was a very, very nice uh, guy, and I really liked him a lot. He was pretty young. He, during my first week uh, that I was working with him, he said, by the way, I'm going up for tenure this year. Don't worry, it's gonna all be fine. Um, it wasn't fine. He didn't get tenure and he was forced to leave the university. And uh, that put me in a very serious pickle because I had to very quickly uh, find another advisor. And I had, you know, now this, this was 2006 uh, and it's right when the first um, environmental engineers started to think about nanotechnology. So nanotechnology is the study of these very small um, structures, uh, materials that you know, were at the time promised, you know, still are uh, promised to revolutionize multiple fields of uh, multiple sectors of our lives, energy production, medicine, um, leisure, whatever, right? They were gonna, they were gonna revolutionize everything. Uh, it was a very exciting time. There was a lot of money being poured into this uh, field by the uh, federal government and state agencies. For environmental engineers, the area that was um, emerging then was this environmental health and safety of nanomaterials. There was real concern that uh, when you uh, use these nanomaterials in whatever application, you know, solar cells or tennis rackets or jet skis or whatever else people were putting um, nanoparticles in, uh, they would be released into the environment and they would just uh, wreak havoc everywhere and destroy ecosystems. And uh, the federal government probably poured in probably $100 million, I believe, into this, into this study, at least $100 million. Uh, Half of it went to, to UCLA, uh, incidentally. So uh, I think uh, Professor Hook was a major recipient of this. I, I believe uh, Professor Mahendra as well. This is back. Uh, Shaley, were you, get, were you part of uh, SANE? No. You weren't? Okay. No. <laughs> okay. But oh, there was a lot of money that came in. I was originally one of the co-PIs. And yeah. we had a UC Toxics uh, program on nanotoxicology for about three years before we got the CEIN money. Yeah. So there was a group of us at Santa Barbara and UCLA that had been working on it for some time. So I was a graduate student at Duke University, and Duke got the other half of the pile. Well, I guess it was less than half of the pile, which we were very bitter about. But it was about a third your, of the pile. your PhD advisor convinced NSF to fund this, yeah. and then yeah. our team outcompeted Money. him. And as a consolation prize, they carved out about twenty-five million for him, yeah. uh, maybe thirty million. Uh, yeah. but we got about fifty million at UCLA. So that's that's sort of the that's how I got it got started in this area. And uh, so I got picked up by, you know, very famous uh, advisor, Mark Wisner at Duke. And I started working on this new exciting area of environmental implications of nanotechnology. And I thought that was really important. I mean, we had a whole community that all of a sudden sprung up. There were conferences dedicated to this topic. There were publications dedicated to this topic. It was really, it was a huge infusion of resources into environmental engineering, I think. Um, uh, and there was a there was a, there was a there was a big echo chamber that formed around this topic. Oh yeah, people were talking and talking and talking how important. But um, regardless of how hard people worked, you know, it ended up being not a big issue. Like in reality, it just wasn't a huge problem. Probably could have been uh, predicted from fundamental knowledge of colloidal science, which we had, you know, for uh, going on a hundred years. Uh, turns out that when you put nanomaterials and nanoparticles into the environment, they react with natural organic matter or go complex with metals or whatever. They, they just become part of the environmental matrix and their uh, reactivity kind of just disappears or is not a, not a big issue. So, um, but you know, regardless as a graduate student, I had no knowledge of this. And I worked very hard and I published some papers and I went to conferences and I participated in this echo chamber. And then in 2011, I was, gonna graduate, you know, right? Because I've been there for about five years. It's time to graduate. And 2011 was probably, at least to me, it felt like the worst year in American history to graduate from a PhD program. There were no jobs. 
I mean, this was the depth of the financial crisis. The financial crisis started in 2008. 2011 recovery still had not started. Um, there were um, 2010, the year before, before I graduated, there were no jobs in the United States for environmental engineering professors. There was no new hires. Everything was frozen. In 2011, there were about 30 positions available in the entire country. Um, and there was a huge backlog already of you know, highly qualified uh, uh, postdocs and PhD students. It was not a good time. I was 35 years old. I had two kids, a mortgage, a dog, um, some gray hair. It was not a good feel, not a good place. I would go to career fairs, um, you know, with my new, newly minted degree. I would stand in line with 200, 200 other, you know, highly qualified PhDs in multiple engineering fields, trying to talk to some rep from, you know, Dow Corning or something, you know, handing our resumes. Nobody would get hired. Um, it was, it was really a uh, kind of a dark time uh, in the U.S., and it was not a good time to be uh, to graduate. Um, fortunately, my advisor agreed to keep me on for a few more months as uh, like a postdoc. And by the time 2012 rolled around, I was able to. There were many more positions that become become available, and I was uh, able to actually secure. Uh, inter you know, uh, interviews, and I ended up getting some job offers. But during that time, I started exploring other opportunities because I, I was very worried that I would never get a job in academics. And I uh, applied for energy companies, pharmaceutical companies, environmental engineering companies, uh, consulting jobs, uh, business consulting. And as the economic um, atmosphere improved in the US. So this is the end of 2011, beginning of 2012, offers started to come in. And I ended up having multiple opportunities uh, with a lot of very interesting companies. And I really realized like, wow, there's a lot out there. There's a lot of opportunities for people who are willing to work hard, uh, have and, and are, you know, able to market themselves in a way that's appealing across a broad spectrum of, uh, to a broad spectrum of entities, including things like I mean, I had an offer from um, uh, from Chevron to go work, you know, in their um, in their environmental engineering, environmental remediation division. I had offers from McKinsey, which is a business consulting uh, company, uh, just you know, and, and various other sort of uh, companies out there. You could think about going work to work for Wall Street. You could go for working for banks, uh, aerospace. They all hire. Uh, graduates in engineering. So there's a lot of career opportunities out there. You just have to be able to market yourself in a way that's broadly appealing. To that point, the best piece of advice that I ever got for job hunting was given to me by Greg Lowry, who is a professor at Carnegie Mellon. Greg is an awesome human being, super chill, just smart. And um, he was the deputy director of the center that I was working for as a graduate student. And I was, when I was looking for a job, he said to me, don't you know, this was all when environmental nanotechnology was still, I still thought was a hot topic, but anybody who had two brain cells uh, knew that it was, you know, in the rear view mirror already. And, you know, the, the, the field was moving on to, to new things and to new problems. Uh, so he said, don't ever market yourself as this environmental nano, as a specialist in environmental nanotechnology. You're a surface scientist. Right? You understand the interactions of materials at, at interfaces. So that's what you need to um, that's what you need to pitch when you talk to anybody, right? You understand the chemistry and the physics at the interface between liquids and solids, right? So, and that's it's not a lie. That's what I was trained trained as. Really, it's a surface scientist. Um, I learned how to. I mean, it was all in the context of this environmental uh, nanotechnology, but ultimately, fundamentally, uh, it was surface science. So. Um, that was, very, that was a very good piece of advice and it really enabled me to expand um, my appeal, I, I believe, to a much wider uh, range of entities uh, because a lot of people don't understand what environmental nanotechnology even means, rightfully so. It's a very niche uh, area. And while for me as a graduate student, it was my entire world and I thought it was very important to the 99.999% of, of everybody else, it made no difference. But people did fundamentally understand what a surface chemist is or surface scientist is because people encounter those kinds of situations in their life all the time. 
So it's very important to be able to label yourself, market yourself, and really define yourself in, in as broad a way as you can. So when I ended up going on these job hunts, uh, I emphasized my fundamental skills and interests. Uh, I basically have a tool set that I can apply to any timely problem. And those problems are constantly changing. Problems that we think are important today, I promise you in five or 10 years, they're probably not gonna be as important anymore because the field moves on, people's interest moves on. Maybe we find solutions, maybe we lose interest. Um, we learn to live with them, we learn to cope with it. Uh, the fields are always changing. Don't get married to a particular problem that you're trying to solve. That is not the right way to um, pitch yourself. Um, invest in fundamental knowledge. Invest in obtaining skills that can be applied broadly. So if you're here, you're environmental engineers, you're probably interested in environmental problems. That's wonderful. That could be sort of your, your world that you're living in. But don't, don't think that, you know, if you're working on, uh, um, I'm sorry, Shaley, I, I'm, you're looking at me, so perfluorinated carbons, you know what I mean? This, you know, this, you know I, I work on that too, but in five, 10 years, it's probably going to go away. It's probably not going to be important. Some new contaminant is going to be on the horizon and everyone's going to be freaking out about it. Since my time, as, since I started being an environmental engineer and moved from 1,4-dioxane to um, dioxins and then to... Um, uh, what else? Kinds of things. BPA was in yeah. there, and then uh, now there's the perfluorinated stuff, and then and it's going to change again. So don't get <laughs> don't get married to the problem. Get married to your tool sets, your fundamental tool sets that you can apply to any problem. So when you drill down and you examine any problem in our field right now, you will see the same skill set or themes popping up over and over again. It could be you can use surface engineering in order to solve these problems or reactor engineering to solve these problems or aqueous chemistry to solve these problems or bioremediation fundamentals in order to solve these problems. There are, it's the same tool set that you apply over and over again. So again, if what you think is important or not important, doesn't matter. What is important is that you gain these tool sets and that you understand how to um, apply them across, across any problem. Um, and fun, you know, finally, um, don't think that what you know is important. Don't think you know what's important. Um, it changes. Your perspective is narrow by definition. You're an expert. Listen and learn from others, particularly from other fields. They have insights that we don't have. The best ideas often come from elsewhere, not from your own field. Because people here, we all, we, we're talking to each other. It's just an echo chamber. Listen to chemical engineers, listen to uh, um, mechanical engineers. They work on completely other problems. Maybe you can apply your tool set, which is unique to problems that they've identified. That's where you can really have an impact. So have an open mind and always be willing to learn. Um, so in my career as a researcher, I've always tried to utilize ideas from, you know, specifically from since I became independent, an independent researcher. So the two areas that I sort of focus on are membrane separation, and electrochemistry, and I try to smash them together in different ways. Um, try to apply these uh, concepts across a wide range of problems. Um, and it's really critical to be able to pivot from a pro one problem to another. The fundamentals don't change. It's the same tool set. You just apply it differently um, to different situations. That's the whole point of being an engineer. Right? We apply science. The science doesn't change. Um, okay, so I'd like to pause here. Let's see, what time is it? It's 1.37. So does anybody have any questions? Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Like, how many languages can you speak? Two. I'm just curious. Just, just two? two? Yeah. Because yeah. we have been a lot of countries. I know. It's been hard sometimes. I really tried to study Vietnamese, but like I just I I my hearing is kind of bad actually from the military. And I have trouble mm -hmm. with uh, tonal languages. I can't hear the variations in tones. I have trouble. 
Um, and okay. Vietnamese has six tones. Chinese has five, I believe. Yes. I, I, it all, I just can't, I, my ear is not sensitive enough. I, maybe it's just an excuse, but I, I could not, I could not, I only know the bad words in Vietnamese. That's <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, this is fascinating. Other people, this questions, you, you can just, you know, speak up, ask them, or you can type them in the chat. Um, uh, we could have a discussion about that. all the, the seminars, I thought this one would generate a lot of interest. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Um, what are your goals as of now in your professional career for your future? Um, so you know, when, you're, when you're a professor at UCLA, it's actually, um, your career is very prescribed. There are very uh, narrow lanes that you actually uh, drive in here. You advance every few years through the ranks of, you know, I'm an associate professor now. Step three, I will be full professor in in two years. Um, it's just it's very everything is very prescribed. So from that in that in that um, in that sense, there's not a lot of flexibility. What I would like to do though is I would like to commercialize one of the uh, technologies that come out of my lab. I think that would be. Uh, a fun and interesting challenge, you know, something very much like Professor Hook has done very successfully. By the way, um, you know, Professor Hook in the area of membrane technology, he is probably, Eric, is there anybody else in the US who's really commercialized it like you have? I can't think of anybody. Um, maybe maybe Livingston in, in the UK, but. Andrews, uh, Andrew had one company, it's now owned by Avonic. Yeah. Made uh, like organic solvent. But that's he's in, in, in the UK, but in the US, uh, I think Professor Hook is probably the most successful professor in environmental engineering and commercializing uh, technology from the lab. Uh, so that's, that's a big deal. And it's really hard. It's a real challenge. But I think it would be really fun, kind of a fun uh, uh, thing to be able to do. Oh, Professor Jasby. So um, in your career, what would you say was the most difficult um, part that you've had to deal with um the period of time when i graduated from my phd and this is something that i talk a lot about with my with my phd students um you uh, are unique everybody every phd student is uniquely unprepared to graduate everybody has their own challenge and the reason is is that you've been in school for so long and it's just like you have to like switch your head and, uh, and, uh, and go out into the real world. And honestly, like being in a PhD, uh, particularly students who have been in school their entire life that have not had, had, not had jobs and have not done other things, which is perfectly fine. Everybody has their own, their own path. But that, uh, that period of time I found was, was very, very stressful because it really required you first that you, cause you still have to work on your on your research, you still have to publish your papers and you know get ready to defend your thesis, but you can't wait until all that is done to start applying for jobs. So you have to do it all in parallel, and that that's that's a very difficult time uh, because it requires you to have your head in two places at the same time, and you can't screw up either of them, and that's really the important thing because. If you screw up your job prospects, then you're not going to have a job. If you screw up your, your research, you won't be able to graduate. So that's the time, that last year of your PhD, you really have to step up. It's really, it's really challenging. You know, all those projects that you have hanging out there, all the data that you never published, all the, you know, all that, all those, you know, outlying things that you didn't take care of, you need to take care of them. And I, and I will say this, I, I've been approached recently, not by students at UCLA, but students at other places, you know, asking me a lot of questions about networking. And, no, and, and I, I, and this is not, not related, Jerry, to what you were asking, but I, I do want to make this point. Networking is very important, but it's much more important to do good research. It's your publications that will market you the best. You know how you're going to get your next job? You publish good papers, you give good presentation at a conference, and somebody's going to walk up to you and say, hey, 
you do good work. Why don't you apply for this job? It's not going to be from other things. That's the that's the real like way to do to get noticed is to do good work. And and you know it doesn't matter how fancy your LinkedIn page is if you have nothing to back it up. It's you have to have some meat on your bones. Yeah. So David, there's a there's a question in the chat. It says, what advice do you have for doing a PhD slash working in academia with kids. Well, a bunch of us work in academia with kids, but David went through grad school. I think Shaylee did as well. Um, why don't you go ahead? Um, I had, so both my wife and I were both in grad in, in graduate school. We were both getting our PhDs. She, she's an epidemiologist, it's a very different field, but we were both in graduate school. It's a terrible and wonderful thing to do. <laughs> it's a real combination. <laughs> on the one hand, it's very hard, but on the other hand, I mean, my schedule was nuts. I would go into the lab at four o'clock in the morning and then I would go home at noon and then my wife would go into work uh, into her to do her research. And then we'd high five at the door, you know, and we, and, and that was basically a, a lot of our interaction for, for, for the PhD. Um, and then we'd both work at night. It's hard, but I didn't play soccer. I wasn't on any intramural mural teams. I um, didn't take two hour lunches. I worked really hard and I was very effective, I think. And I got through my the program quickly and I was I was productive. It sharpens your motivation. There's a tendency uh, amongst students to enjoy graduate school. It's a fun time and it's very it's very hands off. You know, you don't see us very often. We don't breathe down your neck for the most part. We don't, you know. There's a lot of flexibility. You can come in whenever you want. You can go home whenever you want. Nobody's really, you don't have to punch a clock. Um, some people don't do well under those conditions. They kind of spin out of control. It takes them a really long time to, to graduate. Uh, for me, having kids was a very, very, was a lens which you know, I could really focus on. Yeah, I would second that. Um, there's never a good time to have kids. There's never a bad time to have kids. And like your, your talk title says, you roll with the punches, you know, you yeah. can't give them back. I was a single parent for eight years going through grad school. So yeah, yes, crazy. you have to become efficient. I was working around daycare schedules and um, other, other things, but, uh, but it's doable. Yeah. You find your strengths and you find your community. I think that, yeah. that's really important. I think that's Alex raised a hand, Alex. Yeah, thanks. I have a question. Um, what advice would you have maybe for an aspiring professor or academic on how to best manage and maybe manage graduate students? Um, because I think I know a little more about the process of like how faculty become, you know, are excellent researchers, excellent writers, but I'm not really sure on the process of how faculty learn how to be good managers. <laughs> <laughs> we don't. <laughs> we don't. Nobody, th this is the weirdest job. Right, so the first day, imagine like your first day in the office, you show up, maybe you meet your department chair, if he's nice, if they're nice, sorry. You know, you get this like, it's called a startup package, which is several hundred thousand dollars in an account at UCLA. Somebody pats you on the back and says, good luck. That's it, you're gonna be teaching, you know, on Monday, this class, so you better be ready. And, you know, here's your lap space, do with it whatever you want. Uh, so I think we end up uh, probably duplicating our experience as graduate students with you know, how we were advised. And I know I'm, I'm guilty of that because my advisor was very hands-off. Um, I saw him about every six months. Uh, and I don't think I'm quite as hands-off as that, but I'm, I'm very hands-off. Uh, you know, I know Eric is more hands-on than me because he went with, with Manny Ali Malik, who's very hands-on. Yeah, I was just going to say, it, ironically, Mark and many were grad students in the same lab at about the same time. They overlapped by a few years. And Charlie, and it's my advisor and Eric's advisor. Yeah. So Mark, up, Mark yeah. Wiesner yeah. went off to Rice and then, then to Duke. Many started at, um, from Hopkins, came to UCLA, and then, and then moved to Yale. Many is about as far on the other end of the spectrum as you can get from Mark. Mark is a 
he plays i think bass guitar in a in like a, a rock slash jazz band yeah he speaks french he loves to go to he's married to a, a french woman who's a who's a a writer she writes like uh environmental noir novels um i've gotten to know them over the years but many my and and mark is very hands-off and and very loose in how he manages students how he manages research projects many is like i need a weekly report we're going to meet at 8 a.m every friday as a group someone's going to give a presentation he meets with you once or twice a week like very hands-on very um, much directive and and highly highly engaged so at least when when i went through and and they're both national academy members they're both widely regarded among the top you know uh, uh, the, the top of the people in our profession in who work in sort of membranes and water um so there's not a right way uh or a wrong way there's the way that i think fits best with your personality with your lifestyle uh, with your ambitions uh so it's not the answer you're hoping for huh <laughs> yeah. yeah but but you know what i can say is a lot of what i do and how i do it comes from lessons learned of how my advisor did things things that i thought well that's a great that's a great thing to do i'm going to emulate that and eventually you you you're, you're copying you're mimicking right at the beginning but eventually you develop your own version of whatever it was you, have, you, you get your own style there were things that that maybe one speech the advisor does that you're like you know man i hated that like that was the worst part of my whole PhD experience was that that stupid thing x right whatever it was um and maybe it was just being neglected right uh some people want that attention other people are much more independent I'm not going to take any more time away from David, but I think the, another key is that every student is different and, and you got to wear a different pair of gloves to handle each student. So yeah. that's also part of why there's no exact right way, no wrong way. There's the way that you're going to develop over time, your own style, your own habits. Um, and then you still have to continue to adapt and, and, as new students come through and as, as like, you know, the world is very different today in how you talk to or work with a grad student than 20 plus years ago when I was in grad school, very different, better for you guys. Every generation feels that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I talked to my, Go real, real quick, David, sorry for the interruption, oh. but those who are interested in careers in academia, there is a very nice, uh, you know, there's plenty of resources here at UCLA and elsewhere, but I, since grad school, I've subscribed to a mailing list out of Stanford called Tomorrow's Professor. Coincidentally, this Monday's um, email was about how to manage and coach students, so I'll be happy to forward it to this group. I think Professor Mahanti also got it and he shared it with me, so every once in a while things are not as relevant to stem versus other areas but um in in, in terms of a professor teaching emphasis or or research or you know service and administration it, it is pretty cool so I'll, I'll share that all right david back to you <laughs> I, I, I just think that no this was such excellent presentations and yeah. uh, having this kind of slides and telling a story and if you just send that to UCLA Engineering, they'll make a story out of it. <laughs> I don't know if I want the story to share it. <laughs> yes, you know. Yeah, I think one, one thing I want, David, to talk a little bit more about that one comment that you mentioned. Your, your industry boss told you to write yeah. and 25, 30 times in a revision, something that uh, I feel like, you know, as a student, me or, you know, many of my colleagues also I know, we don't really train any students for writing. And they, there is a misconception that if you are in academia, you're writing publications, but if you are not in academia, you don't have to learn writing. Mm -hmm. But that's pretty you know, wrong for every different reason. Uh, so how you, you know, 
how you evolve as a writer during your experience at that place based on the feedback you know i i realized that you you learn you learn how to write from reading yeah so i would read other reports that were acceptable and you basically if you read enough of them and you try to emulate them enough you learn how to write and that's one thing that maybe is very important to emphasize is how formulaic scientific writing is. I mean, we're not writing novels here. We're not writing, you know, this is not high lit. We're writing, you know, papers or proposals and they follow a very particular format. And once you become, once you've read a thousand papers and, and written, you know, a bunch of them, it becomes very easy yeah. to, you become more efficient but you just can't get around the hard work of reading a whole bunch of papers, especially from people who you uh, find easy to read. So, you know, I always use actually uh, Eric's advisor uh, uh, as, a, as a great example. Many Ali Malik's papers are incredibly clear. Yeah. They're like the prototypical research paper in environmental engineering. And if you follow his format, it's, and it's very formulaic, he didn't invent it, by the way. He took it from George Whitesides, the chemist from Duke, from uh, uh, Harvard, who has a method of how you write a, a paper, and that's a whole other presentation that we should think about giving. We should do. We should consider doing that, yeah, in fall. Um, yeah. And then don't be afraid of revisions and rewriting. Yeah. Yes. This, this is just a method to do it. The difference is, I guess, and actually, this is going back to what Alex was asking earlier about how you advise students it's really important to have high expectations in everything that they do. It's really, really important. And if you maintain high expectations, people step up um, and they do good work. If, you know, and that's, that's, that's important. I mean, we're, and, and what the students have to understand, maybe they don't see it at first. Maybe they think, oh, you know, you're being harsh with me or, or not kind or whatever. Is it, you, you guys are here for yourselves. You're not here for us. You're here to learn skills and move out. The goal is not, being in grad school is not the end all be all at all. It's a step, it's, a tr it's still school. Yeah. It's not real life. It's a short period of time, maximize your returns from it. Work hard, learn what you can from us and from any of your friends, your colleagues, and then get out. There's and a whole world out. out there yeah. that's much more interesting than being in school. <laughs> Yeah, Mark uh, raised his hand. Yeah, Professor Jespi, um, I was just wondering, did you ever feel like you wanted to jump ship from your academia route? And if you did, how did you how did you kind of weather through that storm? Um, no. I mean, I wish I had a more interesting answer. I love my job. I think uh, being a professor for me is the best thing I could do. Um, I'd like to earn more money, much like anybody else, I suppose. But uh, it's I have flexibility to work on things that interest me. I get to interact with students, which I enjoy because it's it's fun to interact with people who are younger than you and can keep your head a little bit fresh. Um, and it's it gives me the flexibility that I want to um, to do things that I enjoy in my life that are not related to work. So, you know, I like to surf, so I can go surfing. I don't have a, I don't have a boss that tells me, you know, I need to be in the office at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, and they're, they're, so for me, this works really well. And I, I will also say, actually going back to the question somebody asked about having kids in graduate school. Um, the other really nice thing about that is that when you are graduate student, you have a lot of flexibility and that flexibility disappears when you start working, especially if you start working for a company. And it allowed me and my wife as well to spend a lot of quality time with our young children. And that was, that was great. So I got, to, you know, you know, they didn't go to preschool because we couldn't afford it. We had, we had no money. Uh, so we took care of them the whole time uh, until they went to kindergarten. And um, that was really fun uh, in retrospect. It was hard. But in, in, in retrospect, I really appreciate that time uh, because it's fleeting, it's short, and um, you know, then now they're big, and now I have a 15 year old who's learning to drive, and that's scary. It's really scary. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thanks again, David. I know we're we're getting to the end of the the hour, but uh, I think this these kind of uh, seminars are much more valuable. Uh, of course, you do excellent research, and we want to hear about that. But Some other time. <laughs> another time, yes. But this is what's much more important and meaningful. And thank you for sharing uh, your journey. Absolutely, it's, it's been a real Sorry. pleasure. And I, if if you guys have uh, questions about your career development and you know what you want to do with your life reach out to us. I mean, we've all, we're older than you. We've been there. Uh, we have life experiences that go beyond probably what you are aware of. Um, take advantage of, take advantage of this. Really. It's, you know, I wish I did more of this, of, of interacting with my professors when I was in graduate school, I probably would have avoided some mistakes. Or just made different ones. <laughs> or made different things. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so Shelly, where this recording will be posted, one student asked and also um, I think this is something we should have more access to as opposed to CCLE. Uh, oh. I think this is more important students to hear more and more. If David wanted, you know, we could post it. Yeah, it's fine. On, yes. on I, public. So I typically places. post it to um, the CCLE for the enrolled students, but this is something that I could send a link to Mimi. And yeah. there is a, a place where she can provide a, a shared folder for current and you know former students, prospective students. Also a good time to start a YouTube channel for our uh, for our uh, uh, department. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm gonna stop recording now.